Disasters are fueling the Australian economy. Let's have a look. Hello everyone, I'm Florian Heiser and welcome to another episode of Heiser Says. Once again, working through the day with my stein of coffee in hand, I thought we would have a look at this article, which discusses the impact of foreign disasters on the Australian economy, particularly this one instance in Brazil. And what we'll do is we'll jump here and we'll just look at some stills from this dam collapse. You can see here of the flooding. Jump back here. See it again. Look at that. That is just crazy. So, just shows you what's happening there. Now, this occurred in January this year. Okay, it occurred in January this year. We'll jump here and we'll have a look at the iron ore price. And in about January this year, what was it? 7th of the 1st. Well, January here, we went from our current $85, which is close to the current price of $90, up to 126 122 and then back down so this change in iron ore price which could be in no way managed or predicted by the australian government in the budgeting period in their budget planning is part of the reason why we've got a budget surplus so when our politicians are, are explaining how they're such good budget managers fiscal managers are they managing the economy so well? It's because of a disaster on the other side of the world. Yeah, I th my understanding is they budgeted for around $55 a ton and the price went much higher. So let's have a read through this article. This is from the ABC by political editor Andrew Probin. Australia's economy assisted by foreign disaster, but a sustainable strategy is still needed. Sustainable strategy, let's just say some planning. It's the grim nature of raw economics that when a river of toxic sludge surges down a Brazilian valley killing about 300 people in January, things really looked up for the Australian budget. That's a grim, a really grim perspective to have, isn't it? The disaster caused by the collapse of a, tra a tailings dam at Vale's Iron Ore Mine brought a bonanza to Treasury coffers as the Brazilian company's Australian competitor, Rio and BHP, raked it in. So you have to understand Brazil. And what we'll do is we'll jump here and we'll just look at products. This is the Observatory of Economic Complexity. And what we will do, we'll do a search for, for iron, iron ore. And you can see that Australia Come on, we go which country exported the most. So Australia is the largest exporter of iron ore in the world, followed up by Brazil. So we are significantly you know, more than double Brazil's exports. And then what do we have next? Probably Canada or South, South Africa and Canada. And it, it's funny to think, you know, in what is it, the 50s or the 60s, Australia had an embargo. Or we, we weren't going to export any iron ore. At all we weren't going to export any iron ore at all and right now it's 30 percent in 2017 it was 17 uh 20 percent of our exports were iron ore and you know i'll do a video on that on the, the process of what happened when we actually started exporting it but you can see here how a drastic change in brazil's capacity to export iron ore can affect australia so iron ore priced at 72 dollars a ton at the time of the lethal sludge slide started steadily increasing as Vale's production slipped, reaching 122 a ton. It has since dropped to 91, but this is still 65% higher than the $55 a ton forecast by Treasury for the current financial year. Now, before your eyes glaze over, just remember this. Every $10 over the forecast iron ore price generates a whopping $3.7 for the federal budget over the year. 
Bloody hell, that, that's some good uh, contracts for difference right there. <laughs> that's crazy. This bumper iron ore story has masked troubles afflicting the economy. It is why the Prime Minister and Treasurer can boast that while Germany, Britain and Singapore went backwards in the June quarter, the Australian economy continues to grow. Yes, but, but, I mean, we'll jump here. We'll jump here. Let's have a look. What, what did he compare us to? What did he compare us to? Let's look at, um, we want to look at Australia. We will look at all United Kingdom, Australia, where did he say? Germany. Okay, so the United Kingdom, this is, the, look at what they're exporting. They're exporting $395 billion worth of goods, gas turbines, cars, you know, packaged medicines, crude petroleum, their economic complexity, 1.53, 11th in the world. Let's look at, now we want to look at Australia, we'll look at Germany, their economic complexity, third, 2.08, third in the world. Their exports are 1.33 trillion. Let's look at Australia, good old Aussie, Aussie, Aussie. Our economic complexity, 59th, 0 0.09. Look at what we're produ producing. I mean, it's, it really is a, and I know I've compared Australia to Germany before. It, it, we're not comparing the same things. We're not comparing the same things. We may be a, well, a modern Western country here with regards to uh, our civilization and the rights that we currently have steadily losing but i would say we do not have the well our economy just frankly is not as advanced as these other economies that we're being compared to i mean even singapore i mean come on so 28 years of uninterrupted growth is an extraordinary record even if another's misery has been to our benefit 28 years yes 28 years of uninterrupted growth but we still have no a manufacturing sector is going backwards and manufacturing sector is going backwards. We're just exporting primary product. We're exporting low complexity product. We're not even upgrading our iron ore. I mean, how much are we upgrading? Refined zinc, refined nickel, refined lead, scrap iron, you know, not even a billion dollars. Scrap copper, not even a billion dollars. Wow, okay, that is the isolated mineral products. Oh, well, no. So, yeah. It's just iron ore. We want to isolate our metal products. Sorry, guys. Zinc. Cold roll iron. 192 million. Hot rolled. 177. Scrap iron. We're, we're sending out more scrap than we are. So, we're sending out the, the iron ore. We're getting it back as metal. We're rolling it or manufacturing it and we're sending out scrap again. So, I mean, there you go. There we go. Have we, have we pretty much pissed away these 27 years or 28 years of uninterrupted growth? It feels like we have. Right, back to the article. But how to keep the growth going is in contention, especially in what Josh Frydenberg described this week as a new world with low interest rates, relatively low unemployment and low inflation. We need to be looking at underemployment. Underemployment is much worse. You've got people with multiple jobs. Just look at DFA's new video on it. Beneath the Treasurer's uh, pol what is it? Polian uh, performance on Wednesday, where he sugarcoated the worst economic data since the GFC, the government appears to be in hot disagreement with the Reserve Bank. Key people within the Morrison government believe the RBA should have cut the official interest rates harder and sooner. They also believed Governor Philip Lowe has more slashing to do despite the cash rate already being at an historic low of 1%. The tension between the coalition and the, and the RBA isn't anywhere near the outright hostility seen in the United States, where Donald Trump has asked, the, asked whether the Federal Reserve Chair, Jeremy H. Powell, is a bigger enemy than Chinese President Zhang Zipin. Zipin. I buggered that up, I know I did. But the Morrison government is clearly of the view that the reserve should do more to stoke life into the stuttering economy. I mean, guys, we're not going to fall for it. 
Okay, we are not going to fall for it. You cut interest rates a lot. We're not going to be running out there and buying stuff. I mean, come on. Who Who is foolish enough to do that? Don't, don't answer the question, guys. Maybe there are a lot of people foolish enough to do it. But really, if, if all your friends are, you know, getting quiet, if you're hearing all, you know, nothing, there's contrary stuff in the news, there's all this unrest overseas. I mean, do people just not look at this stuff do they believe every single word they're told by the government do they not question it is is uh, am i just in a youtube bubble guys are we just all preppers is that what it is we all just stackers preppers uh you know is, is that the the community that I'm, I'm watching too much i i don't know dr low stuck between a rock and a hard place dr low must feel like he can't win on this front only last month uh, liberal luminary John Howard criticized the Re Reserve Bank for cutting too deeply, saying it, it left little room in the event of a crisis. But Dr. Lowe would, only, would be only too aware that there are folk in government wanting him to cut further. He should have cut slower, I reckon, and earlier. But then again, it's easy, easy to comment on it from the outside. And the frustration expressed by the chair of the House of Representatives Standing Committee on Economics, Liberal MP Tim Wilson, that the Reserve has serious, serially failed to keep inflation within the target range of 2 and 3%, is now clearly shared by Mr. Frydenberg. The Treasurer plans to introduce a system of please explain for the Governor every time quarterly figures show the inflation target hasn't been reached. Given the public's statements from Dr. Lowe of late, the Governor might consider this proposal as passing the buck. That's because Dr. Lowe has made clear several times his view that engineering an economic jumpstart has to be a joint operation between Martin Place and Capitol Hill. He used a speech three days after the election to make this point saying job creation was key. In the event that the under unemployment rate does not move lower with current policy settings, there are a number of options, he told the Economic Society of Australia. These include further monetary easing, additional fiscal support, including through spending on infrastructure, and the structural policies that support firms expanding, investing, and employing people. Relying on just one type of policy has limitations, so each of these is worth thinking about. We already have significant infrastructure spending. We should have had infrastructure spending earlier. The problem is if you do too much infrastructure spending at any one time, you get overheating and you get issues. Just look at the building education revolution. Look at all the, all the differences. In the outcomes, I, I'll find that report and I'll do a video on it. But essentially, the private schools who took it much slower, who had their own control over it, and employed their own architects directly, got a much better outcome, much better value for money than the public schools that use the building education revolution. That just got okay. You need a hall, boom. You need a lunchroom, boom. Here's your pa your plan: copy, paste, stick, do. And the fees that the people were charging to project manage these things was insane. So, forcing Morrison's hand proving difficult. Uh, since delivering that speech, Dr. Lowe's overseen two interest rate cuts and not ruled out cutting more. But he's also been consistent in urging the government to consider extra infrastructure spending and economic reforms and not simply relying on monetary policy to do the heavy lifting. Convincing the Commonwealth to do more on infrastructure will be difficult. Scott Morrison thinks it's already at its limit. Here's an idea. Here is an idea. For anyone buying a home or an apartment, you can write off your interest payments on a home, owner occupier home. So I could write off the interest on my mortgage. What do you think? Anyone could do it. This, this is a policy put forward by Palmer. No one, no one spoke about it. I, I would put money. I mean, I would rather the government does that to try to keep one. It'll help people keep in their homes. Okay, it will reduce economic stress for people all the time. They can start writing that off. It will um, increase people's buying capacity. You know, right now more people will have buying capacity. Well, it, w it won't overheat the market because investors, well, they'll still be able to negative, negative gear, but it won't be a d reduction in the interest rates. Why don't we look at that? Why don't we look at tax policy to stimulate the economy? Just an idea. No one's talking about it. What do you think about that one in the comments, guys? Do you think that would work better? Do you think that would have more of an impact than interest rate cuts. Maybe it take maybe it would take too long to filter through. Maybe you need to instantly allow people to claim a cre credit 
you know, they can claim up to one year's credit in their interest repay interest payments ahead and then get that as a payment. Use either pay down debt or whatever. I don't know. I mean, if they're gonna be if they're gonna be printing money and giving it to bondholders, maybe they should be looking at smarter alternatives to actually get it into the hands of the populace. Because it's our civilization. If they're gonna stuff it up and centrally man manage it, you know, they might as well try something a bit different. So we are really starting to hit our head on the ceiling in terms of how much infrastructure work you can get underway at any one time, the PM said on Thursday. Yes, I've read about this and other things too. It's just the number of engineers we have, to be honest. And there isn't any detectable appetite in the ministerial wing for any significant economic reforms that might satisfy the likes of Dr. Lowe. Nor is there any desire to embark on any stimulatory spending that would imperil the budget surplus. The surplus obsession shared by Labour and Liberal administrators over the past dozen years has become acute with the current coalition as its uh, attainment looms tantalizingly close. Will that win you votes, though, when pensioners can't afford to pay power? This has complicated the questions of whether, of sorry, of what, when and how to get the economy going. But what, what's clear enough is that Philip Lowe and Josh Frydenberg don't see the solution the same way. And nor do I. What do you think, guys? Let me know. Like, share, and subscribe. And I'll see you next time. Bye for now.